some audio problem earlier um, in the morning um, when you were speaking, um, but I think now it may have been rectified. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, and uh, very much appreciate the um, organizers giving me the opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, one of the ongoing projects that uh, I'm working with, uh, with the company Aminex Therapeutics that we have taken uh, to advance an approach to cancer that um, has involved the immune system. And that discovery opened up the possibility that you could have an approach. Yes, Dr. Palfrey, it seems the uh, audio is continuing to go in and go out. Uh, not quite sure what to do here. This is a. Uh, is Mark. Uh, yeah. Mark Burns is here. Um, I think maybe he could also. He, I do see Mark Burns in the room. Um, if, if he wants to speak uh, on this slide deck. Maybe. All right, Mark. If if Mark is if Mark can um he he has the this is his program so um if he's willing to do that he has the slides and you can move them through. Can you take that over, Mark? So I just upgraded Mark right now. I apologize to everyone. The, the um, my um, I'm actually my office is in uh, in southern Florida, and the internet connections here are appallingly bad. Hey, Mike. Um, hi, Sam. Yeah, Mark hi, here. Mark. <laughs> Can you take over the program? You sound much clearer than I. <laughs> okay, am. great, great. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Mike, for. Uh, Introducing uh, the program. Um, yeah, I'm Mark Burns, uh, the president and CEO, chief science officer at Aminex Therapeutics. And certainly I can step in and uh, <laughs> help, help out here and describe this. Um, and, and basically what we're doing with Aminex's approach is uh, removing the polyamines, which are immunosuppressive uh, from the tumor microenvironment. And in doing so, uh, we see this profound impact on the immune activation uh, against the tumor cells. Um, so it was really, really quite in, insightful when we first saw that. We do, didn't really expect that. Um, we thought that the uh, polyamines were, would be uh, uh, part of the proliferative activity um, in tumor cells. Uh, but when we first looked in an immunocompetent animal model, we saw this effect on stimulating the immune system. And generally what we uh, uh, believe is that the polyamines are there uh, to mask the tumor cell from uh, an immune attack. Um, uh, so if you can move to the next slide, Sam. There we go. Yeah, and <clears throat> Since those um, early models that we looked at, we've tested it in uh, numerous other uh, tumor models and quite aggressive tumor models, I, I might add. These are uh, all immunocompetent animals, uh, mice, and we uh, see this activity, we believe, both from the anti-proliferative effect of taking the polyamines away together with that immune reaction that we observe against the tumor. Um, neuroblastoma and I, uh, another children's cancer, uh, DIPG, we see really stunning results and we'll show some of that a little bit later, but also some of these other really aggressive tumor models, pancreatic, the KPC mouse, it works very well. Um, and the other ones shown here as well. So I, I would say that the majority of tumor models we've looked at, as long as they have a functioning immune system, we see a dramatic effect against the tumor. And I might add that that's probably more reflective of what's going to happen in a patient in the clinical setting. Uh, so we're very hopeful that this is going to uh, demonstrate some profound effect against the tumors. Uh, next, off, next slide. And an example of that, uh, the, this poor mouse, um, it's a, a chemically induced tumor there with the uh, uh, no treatment, uh, that was the initial size of the tumor on these uh, guys. Um, and treatment over four weeks, these, these very large tumors completely disappeared. And after the four weeks of treatment, that's the treatment stopped. And we followed these guys out for another six weeks and the tumors did not come back. Um, 
So this is a, a very dramatic um, effect um, that, uh, yeah, a little visually upsetting, but uh, this is where the real insight came. Okay, we are stimulating uh, an immune reaction against these tumor cells. Uh, next slide. Uh, graphed out another way. You can see the control there. They grow very aggressively and quick. Um, and the green line is the treated group. 88%, um, 15 of uh, 17 of these uh, tumors uh, completely regressed and went away. Um, yeah, when I saw this data, I knew we had something. <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh, and to demonstrate the uh, ability of this treatment to stimulate an immune influx, we are looking at different antibody labeling. Uh, CD3 cells, uh, which are the tumor fighting lymphocytes, and also CD8 positive cells. And these slides are from various time treatments and the increased level of that label, uh, the darker brown color, uh, signifies that we are seeing a great influx of immune reactive cells into the tumor microenvironment. Next slide. And to show again that this requires a functioning immune system, uh, when we use the same tumor cells um, in mice on the uh, left-hand side without a functioning immune system, without T cells, uh, we did not see any effect. Uh, but when we use those same T, those same, same cancer cells in a mouse with a functioning immune system, we saw this uh, dramatic effect, um, highlighting the ability of the immune system to work against the tumor. Uh, next slide. And we've uncovered some information that's very intriguing. Uh, we're obviously trying to get at the mechanism of how this actually suppresses the, um, you know, immune suppression in the tumor microenvironment. And what we think is going on is we're having an effect on the more immunosuppressive myeloid deprived suppressor cells in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so these slides show that those cells go away. Uh, these are cells that uh, pop up in inflammation or especially in the tumor uh, microenvironment and prevent an over immune reaction. And that's what we believe is happening here. This therapy uh, reduces that immune cell subset in the tumor microenvironment, giving us a, a, the dramatic effects we see. Next slide. Summarized on this page, um, mm -hmm. uh, what we believe is happening, um, tumors grow up in the presence of the immune system, and these tumor cells are actually uh, sculpted, is, is the term, or evolved. Only those tumor cells that can suppress the immune system can survive and, and multiply and cause the disease. Uh, and we think that their ability to generate the immunosuppressive molecules, uh, polyamines, um, uh, give them that selected evolutionary advantage. And what we believe our therapy does is it removes that advantage and allows the immune system to come in and attack the tumor. Um, so we certainly believe and have data to support that this used in conjunction with immune checkpoint blocking antibodies, um, pull another brick out of the wall of that immunosuppressive microenvironment of the, the, the tumor. Uh, so we have uh, uh, high hopes that this is going to uh, really dramatically affect what happens in the clinic. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we transitioned from the preclinical setting where we have a, a great body of evidence that this will work um, into the clinical setting. Um, and one of the preclinical pieces of data really gives us great um, hope and expectation that this will be uh, profoundly successful. Uh, these 
graph showed the treatment of tumor bearing animals and uh, we measured the levels of the drug in both the tumor uh, and that is the green and the uh, purple line on top, drug level and tumor versus drug level in the plasma, the red and the blue line. Um, uh, dramatic retention of this drug in the tumor. Uh, and if you look at the area under the curve, uh, we've got like 14 times higher level of the drug in the tumor. So um, we believe that these, this drug is associating with the tumor and staying there. So it's, uh, I can't say that we predicted this, but it is certainly tumor selective. Um, uh, knock on wood. <laughs> um, next slide. Uh, here are a couple of graphs uh, showing the effect of uh, this therapy on a uh, transgenic uh, model of neuroblastoma. Uh, neuroblastoma is a childhood cancer. Um, it's not a CNS uh, tumor. It is in the peripheral of these children. Um, and it's very challenging to treat. Uh, and th this graph shows uh, that we do see a increase in survival of these animals that are bearing these tumors. Um, yeah, and Mike, I think we have newer data that is even more stunning. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, next slide. Here's, oh, maybe this is it, yeah. Uh, so these are uh, 1501 and DFMO treatment of these uh, mice with neuroblastoma. And you can see the increased survival. Um, and we have also anticipate that this will be used in conjunction with uh, chemotherapy, cyclophosphamide. Um, and this uh, data has been published. Um, and the bottom graph there shows the combination. We do see a synergy uh, increased survival benefit with a uh, combination with the uh, 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 chemotherapy. Next slide. And this is data from the DIPG. Uh, again, a very uh, uh, unfortunately hard to treat uh, children's tumor model. Um, and treatment over this time period, the red line, uh, greatly increased the uh, survival of these animals. Um, next slide. So we have uh, started and are in, in the midst of a phase one to a adult trial, uh, where our ultimate goal is to show what we did in those animals is possible in people. Um, and I could certainly give a you know, full seminar on this transition. Um, it's really challenging because we've got two drugs, one approved DFMO um, with a large body of information behind it. But how do you combine that with a, a new chemical entity, uh, AMXT 1501, um, in the clinical setting? And we had to dissect that a bit. Um, uh, we started with, with what we called part one, where we took 1501 and increased its dose with a fixed low dose of DFMO and treated, I think uh, so far, maybe 20, 25 patients. Um, and we have transitioned into part two, where we will keep that higher dose of 1501 steady and increase the level of DFMO, uh, dose level of DFMO in those patients. Um, and, and that's where we are, transitioning from part one to part two uh, currently, uh, and uh, have hope to see benefit in these patients um, in the next few cohorts. Um, uh, obviously a very exciting and um, intriguing program that is made complex by that uh, two agents going after the same uh, biological pathway in the clinic. Um, you know, uh, um, next slide. Uh, 
So in summary, we uh, believe that the polymines are behaving as immunosuppressive uh, metabolites. And when we take those polyamines away, uh, we actually unleash an immune uh, system attack on the tumor. Um, this is certainly uh, something that we would expect to be uh, able to be combined with immune checkpoint uh, blocking antibodies um, and, and see better, better benefit in the clinic. Uh, but first off, we have to demonstrate safety and tolerability in a phase one study. Um, and fingers crossed, we will hope to see some great benefit. Uh, next slide. And with that, I will thank everybody that was a part of the Aminex team, including Kathy Falsnaw and Mike Palferman, um, and especially the patients that are really stepping up uh, to help us out and help out, I, I believe, uh, future patients that this, uh, this drug therapy could help. Um, those patients are the true heroes of our industry, and I want to acknowledge them. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark, uh, for stepping in. And there is a question for you from Larry Hardy. Um, he says, impressive that AMXT1501 is concentrated and retained in the tumor tissue in mice. Are, is, there is there data to assess whether the compound will behave this way in human tumors? Uh, we'd like to gain that data, uh, but um, uh, gaining access to tumor biopsies in the clinic um, in a, you know, phase one person human study is a challenge. Um, so we hope to get that data, but we don't have it yet. And yeah, if there's any other question for Mark Burns, uh, Dr. Paul Freeman, and for Kathy, um, do let me and my team know. Um, you know, we can always connect you with them directly. Um, if you want I, their slide deck, um, we can also, um, with their permission, share that with you as well. Um, well. Mark, there were, I think, a couple of attendees that were interested in an introduction with you in November. Um, and I think Sherry will send you the details of that shortly as well. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, I'll be happy to follow up. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark.